going to change this up and switch this up at, at, at Ben's advice. And, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about a problem more than necessarily my solutions for this problem. Uh, so over the past few years, uh, my, my team and I have been thinking a lot about how do you uh, compute and store information using solutions of small molecules. So instead of thinking about proteins, instead of thinking about DNA, how do you do things using small molecules? And one thing that we realized uh, is the key issue here is how do you make wires? How do you communicate between these different molecules? Uh, so even if you're not dealing with molecules, um, you often might think of having nanomachines, and those nanomachines have to transduce information in some way, potentially across solution. And so one key issue is how do you make wires, and I don't mean wires in a physical sense, but com communication vessels that go between uh, different species in solution. Uh, so the motivation for this uh, is, is a lot of our group's work thinking about storage uh, and computation. Uh, so what we've done uh, is, is we thought about how do you store large amounts of information in mixtures of, of small molecules. And so this is sort of a, a new paradigm for, for storing information. Um, typically what people think about when they want to store information in molecules is they think about storing that information in polymer sequences, right? So ordered sequences of nucleotides or amino acid units. Um, but the way that we came up with which happens to be about an order of magnitude more dense, uh, is to store so in, in solutions of small molecules where you encode a bit in the presence or absence of a molecule in solution. Uh, and so here I'm showing an example set of molecules. Uh, when we first did this, we thought about using multi-component molecules because you can combine uh, a large number of components to make an even larger number of different uh, small molecules to store information in. Um, but later we realized that this concept applies essentially to all molecules. Uh, and so what you can do with this is, is by forming your mixtures, uh, you can actually encode large amounts of information. So this is Picasso's violin, for example. And then you can read out that information using a variety of different chemical techniques. Uh, we chose mass spectrometry uh, just because it's extremely versatile. Um, but suffice it to say, what we were able to show is that, in fact, um, you can get around using DNA. So you know, why would you want to get around using DNA? Maybe you want to source your molecules from different places. You don't want to rely exclusively on DNA. Uh, and we get around DNA and, and still be able to store large amounts of information. Uh, and in fact, in just a couple of years that we were doing this, these are most of these blue points on this chart showing total data storage are, are our points. Uh, we, we've been able to show that we can get up in the range of genomic DNA uh, with not much of a trouble. And what, what I can tell you is uh, our company right now uh, can prove that we can go up at least three to four orders of magnitude very straightforwardly. Going up eight is going to be hard, but going up four can be readily done. What we also realized during this process is that if we're gonna store information in molecules, we wanna compute on those molecules as well. So I'm just gonna show you one example of such computation. We've worked out many different schemes. Uh, and, and this example is basically what we call a molecular perceptron. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with perceptrons, I guess most people here probably are, uh, perceptrons are binary classifiers. Uh, they're able to take in different inputs and tell you, uh, is, is it a cat or is it a dog? One of two different classes. Uh, and what's really convenient convenient about these perceptrons uh, is that the, the basic functional units that are going on in here are multiply accumulates uh, and then activation functions that you operate on those multiply accumulates. Um, if you think about this, uh, which I did several years ago, uh, molecules do this actually pretty readily. Uh, so whenever you, you have a unique species of a molecule, its concentration is a weight uh, and its identity uh, is, is essentially like one of the inputs. Uh, and so whenever you mix fluids together, you automatically get a multiply accumulate function. You can also get multiply accumulate functions in other ways, for example, using kinetics, et cetera. Uh, and so chemistry automatically does this. Uh, and in fact, chemistry also automatically does things like activation functions. If you think about activation functions, like a sigmoidal function, you're really looking for a chemistry uh, that, that is autocatalytic, that has uh, a positive feedback loop such that you go from uh, very low concentrations to high concentrations that perform your thresholds. Uh, and so in fact, uh, you can do computation. So, so this is just showing uh, what you can do using an autocatalytic reaction that looks exactly like a sigmoidal function. Um, just using chemical reactions, you can put this whole thing together and, and make a perceptron just out of small molecules. Uh, so just to go into slightly more detail before I pivot to the problem, um, you know, we implemented this using a specific copper catalyzed autocatalytic reaction. Uh, and putting this together, what we were able to do is make a winner-take-all network. Uh, we, we haven't published all of our results yet. Some of those will, will be posted 
probably in the next month or so. Uh, but we can go beyond well, one layer network, which I show here, and actually do multiple layers of networks that cascade, uh, all in solution to do machine learning for you. Suffice it to say, what the, my, my point here and where the problem comes up is that in doing this, uh, we, we are doing chemistry through the autocatalytic reaction, but we're missing wires, okay? Uh, so when we do this, we, we oftentimes use well plates. We, we put our molecules in well plates, and we move those molecules around using liquid handling or, or some other fluid transfer. And that's because if we throw all these molecules in all together, uh, we, we don't have the fortune of, of, of DNA necessarily, that we can throw everything in together and have the reactions all work at the same time. And so we oftentimes are transferring things from place to place. Uh, and so the issue that we face is that, you know, in all regular electronics, there are really, really nice systems of wires that connect the, the outputs of one thing uh, to the inputs of another. And when you're in solution, where are those wires? So those wires for us are, are chemical reactions. Uh, this ultimately comes down to different types of chemical reaction networks that interconnect our molecules to each other. So our wires are chemical reactions. But if you're working with things that are not, let's say, DNA, don't rely on hybridization, you know, these wires uh, have issues. Um, these wires are great because if you're working in solution, that's automatically 3D computation. You're not relying on a 2D surface to orchestrate your computing, so you're getting more dimensionality. They're also great because now you can compute in a relatively small space. But the problem is, is that these wires are inherently leaky, right? So if we, we have reactions that interconnect these, they're not always going to give you high yield. It's very hard to get high yield. You're also not just going to be able to wire everything up to each other. That's not an automatic thing for us. You know, input to output, output to input uh, is not exactly what you get out of these different systems. Uh, and so for, for chemistry and solution, this is a huge problem. You know, how are we going to make these molecular wires perform the functions that we want to, to be able to do computation and orchestrate other forms of information processing? So if, if I turn to my mathematician friends, you know, what they'll, and my computer science friends, what they'll always tell me is, you know, we figured out everything with respect to wires years ago. You can program them up um, using different chemical reaction networks. But the problem that I'll, I'll, I'll pose to you is, you know, given those other deficits, the other issue is uh, that a lot of these reaction networks were worked out for, for DNA and not worked out for, for other types of chemistries. So if I look at these reactions, actually I've, I've done this exercise, if I go to an organic chemist and say, hey, could you tell me a set of reactions that do, that do these things? They'll stare at you like you're absolutely out of your mind. Um, so, you know, something S plus X goes to 2X, and then you combine it with something else, and you get a totally different set of products. That rarely happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but this would be very, very hard to orchestrate in any other sort of chemistry. Uh, and so there's a fundamental issue here that we have a lot of theories that are worked out um, for hybridization reactions. And, and perhaps not even hybridization reactions in some cases that just don't work in, in, in chemistry. Uh, and so the, the, the problem that I'm posing here, and I won't say that I have all the solutions, I've thought down these paths, uh, is that what we need to do uh, is, is, is if we want to compute in solution, we have to have reaction networks that interlink with each other that can compute but they have to be realized in real chemistries. So we have to map these CRNs to actual chemistries that, that can orchestrate those different CRNs. Uh, and there's a huge chasm uh, that we have to jump in order to do that. So let me uh, just cut to the chase. Um, this is an extremely difficult feat, uh, but there are paths to doing this. Uh, there, there are things coming uh, along and, and, and paths that, that we've been taking, you know, using machine learning, actually cataloging reactions, et cetera. But what's really necessary to bridge this chasm uh, in order to make solution phase, you know, large system computing possible uh, is, is work between experimentalists and theorists to actually create sets of reaction networks that would do something for you. So we can't just go theoretically say this will do. Um, we need to actually have experimentalists thinking through the, the, the reactions that are possible along with theorists to actually make these different networks and wires. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and just mention, you know, we, we have a startup on, on molecular storage that's also dealing with these, these kinds of questions in molecular computing. Um, sorry, uh, really amazing talk. Uh, on a very layman's uh, term, um, 
would it be potentially possible to combine uh, the DNA reaction networks and uh, the localization uh, um, <laughs> example Andrew uh, basically showed before? Absolutely. I, I'm really excited about that possibility. Uh, so you can imagine actually using DNA to, to template spatially. Uh, so one of our big issues is space. I didn't go into that fully, but you can use DNA to template spatially and then to help orchestrate those kinds of reactions. And that would, well, that would chain DNA to, to the real solution phase chemistry that many chemists think about. Absolutely. Great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, first of all, really exciting work of uh, using uh, organic molecule to store information. Uh, I wonder, can you make some comments regarding the, uh, you know, the density of information storage using this technique and also the, the speed of readout? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, very good questions. Uh, so, so the density uh, tends to be about an order of magnitude larger than, than for DNA. Uh, so if you work out what are the volumes of these molecules, these, these volumes are going to be of the order of you know, uh, tens of angstroms cubed or so. Uh, and, and so that's actually smaller than, than most base pairs in, in DNA. So we can get quite small. Uh, in, in terms of time, uh, this is absolutely something that our, our startup is, is, is trying to work on. So, so we are limited uh, by how fast we can write, which DNA has, has solutions, um, but reading is also not necessarily that fast. So we can do gigabytes of information read out in on the order of a day, right? So that's not super fast, uh, and so we're trying to push that much, much faster. Um, so when you're doing, you're reading out mass spec, my understanding of mass spec is that it's pretty poor for concentration identification. Did you guys use like a fancier mass spec method or? Oh, you, you, you are a hundred percent right. Uh, so, so this is, this is something that mass spec fails on. So, so we're looking for identification of, of unique compounds. And so we haven't been using concentrations. Turns out that that concentration actually doesn't give you that much more information. Uh, you know, maybe a factor of three or four, but we're not talking orders of magnitude. So, so we, that's, that's right on, and I can go further into it if you want. <laughs> 